Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Happy Lord's Day and Happy New Year. Uh, today we're going to start a new book, the book of Ezra. In fact, we're going to do Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther because they all kind of tie together as we study together. But first, let's pray together. Dear Lord Jesus, we bring glory to your name. We honor you, Lord, and we ask that you speak to each of us the word we need to hear, God. Open our mind, open our hearts, open our ears, and open our eyes. Lord, and help us to comprehend what is the depth and the height of the love of God. And help us to get this word, Lord. Lord, I ask for a special blessing on all those that hear this, Lord. May it minister to them. And Lord, I just ask you to be with any prayer request on people's hearts today. Lord, I ask you to be with those that have lost loved ones. Many are still grieving. Those that are sick, Lord, those in the hospital, those that are having tests and treatments, Lord, that are very serious. And I ask you to be with them. Lord, there are some that are carrying very heavy burdens. I lift them up to you as well. Speak to us through your word and bring glory to your name, Lord. We honor you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, I generally alternate between Old and New Testament. And we just did Ephesians and um, Colossians. Before that, we did Daniel. Um, and I think Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther are a good follow-up <clears throat> to Daniel because we had studied Jeremiah about the coming judgment and the captivity and how they would go to captivity, but they would come back in 70 years. And it was judgment from God for them departing from God and serving other gods and idols. Um, but also in Daniel is during the captivity. While they're there in the prophecy and how God showed faithfulness, even in the midst of, a, of, of an area that is, is not conducive to God's work, but yet they did it and they showed it could be done. And God blessed them through that because you can be a believer anywhere. And then this message is about the three different returns that we're going to talk about that take place uh, following that 70-year captivity, how they go back to Jerusalem. It's also an excellent book on how to bring revival, which is a great way to start the year. But let's look at the, the breakdown outline of these books together. Ezra and Nehemiah, I like the way this slide shares it. It says, repent, return, rebuild, and restore. And that's a good good uh, way of going through revival. We got to repent and turn around first. We return to God. Then we can rebuild what God wants, and we can restore a right relationship with God. Um, Ezra and Nehemiah were originally written as, as one book, but they were later broken out into two books. But actually, it covers three different returns. The first six chapters of Ezra deal with the return and the rebuilding of the temple that was led by Zerubbabel. And uh, the 7 through 10 talks about Ezra and how he leads a second return. He was a priest. He leads a second return, initiates reforms in worship. In other words, they first went back to rebuild the temple, and then they go back later and restore the, the true form of worship and getting our hearts right with God. A, a church is just a building if we don't have our hearts right with God. You worship Him in spirit and in truth. And then the third return there in the time of Nehemiah, when he went back to build the fortifications, the walls around the city, and some of the city itself. And then Esther, the book of Esther, falls somewhere between the first and second returns. So let's look at some of the information on this. This just shows you a little bit of the time frame, the chronology. The first return under Zerubbabel, like I said, it's Ezra 1 through 6, occurred somewhere around 537 B.C. to 516 B.C. Then you have the book of Esther in between the first and second return around 473 B.C. And then you have the time of Ezra. And Ezra the priest comes up in chapters 7 through 10. And that's, that's probably about 60 years following 
the first return. So it's been a good period of time where he goes back with a second group of exiles. And then the third return under Nehemiah is in, is in the book of Nehemiah, which is around 437 B.C. So this gives you an idea of the time frame we're looking at. But let's talk about the, the it's really three books, but they combine two of them into Ezra, into one book. Let's talk about who Zerubbabel and Ezra are from the book of Ezra. Zerubbabel, he was the grandson of King Jehoiachin, he's sometimes called Konia, uh, of Judah. And so he's from the kingly line, and if you remember, they had many uh, short-term kings during the time of Jeremiah and the time of judgment. And he warned them all not to try to stay in Jerusalem. Do not fight what the word of God is saying, but you will be spared if you go into captivity. Well, of the three, um, Jehoiakim is the only one that went back. And the other two, God says, you're not going to have a line from now on. You're not going to be part of the kingly line. However, because Jehoiachin was of the line of David, he still was part, a descendant of King David. And he also was born in Babylon, so he was born during the time of captivity. And he's an ancestor of Jesus Christ. He's in the, the line of Jesus Christ. And it just shows how God can use people, even if their parents or grandparents were not faithful. But if he's faithful, then God can use you greatly. And he restored a lot of great things. And he later, even though he wasn't a king, the king line ended at that point, but he did become governor of Judah after the exile. He was a leader. He was, he was one that, that led the people. Uh, Ezra, which is in chapters 7 through 10. Ezra was a scribe as well as a priest. He was a high priest that led worship and, and led the people back to true worship. But he was also a scribe. If you remember in the Sanhedrin, they had scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. Well, the chief priest and scribe, scribes were recording the law and recording the book of, of, well, the Bible. They were recording. And Ezra, from all counts, we know he wrote the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. And so he, even though he wasn't there in the first six chapters of Ezra, he's the one that recorded the events from both those books, as well as Chronicles. Many people attribute the book of First and Second Chronicles. And you can tell from his order and his history and and the numbers he, he, he writes down that he's very specific about things. He's an excellent scribe. So he wrote a good part of the Old Testament. Um, and he restored worship and spiritual revival. Here's another timeline that it shows. These all happened during the Persian Empire. Persia came in and conquered Babylon during the captivity. Uh, they first went into captivity around 606 B.C., and then they went back on the first return in 536 B.C., roughly. So that's exactly 70 years to the date that Jeremiah said they would return. During the time of Ezra, and they became very influential in this time period, Haggai and Zechariah prophesied. And uh, they prophesied about not giving up on the temple, that you need to, to, to focus on God's house first, and how can you live in paneled houses and not take care of God's house. Uh, so they got the people's heart back on the right track. Um, then you have the book of Esther in an interlude, like 60 years, and uh, the book of Esther occurs, Queen Esther. And then Ezra chapter 7, around 458, he restored God's law, and uh, he restored right worship and reform, and, and that was led by Ezra. Um, and then you have the book of Nehemiah, which starts around 444 B.C., that went back to rebuild the walls. And then Malachi prophesied right after the time of Nehemiah, and uh, he was the last prophet from the Old Testament. And then we have the silent years from 400 B.C. until the time of Christ. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of how everything fit together. A couple of important dates to remember uh, Persia conquered the Babylonian Empire around 539 B.C., so just before uh, they, they returned. <clears throat> then you have the edict from King Cyrus 
uh, when the Jews returned. In their first return, there were 49,897. Incredible <laughs> number, you know. It's, it's, it's so much to the point in the Bible. Um, and they returned under Zerubbabel. And then you have Haggai and Zechariah prophesying and the temple completed in 515 B.C. Uh, then you have the time Esther becomes queen. Then you have the second return, which was only about four or 5,000 exiles. Not everybody returned from Babylon. Not everybody came back that eventually went there. Some stayed there. But these are the ones that returned. And uh, that was led by King Ezra. And then at the time of Nehemiah, he went back with the third exile or third return in 444. So this just gives you an idea of the time frame and the kings that were in charge at that time. So let's go ahead and look at Ezra chapter 1 and start reading. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, that the, world, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whoever is left of any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offerings for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. That's an amazing prophecy that a king, a foreign king, uh, a pagan king, King Cyrus, would do the work of God and be led by God. And we're going to talk about why he did. And he even, he let the people go freely. He told them that he was commanded to build a house for God and that they were to go back and, and that the people of the land were to help them and give them gifts on their way out and silver and gold and things to help them rebuild. This can only happen by the hand of God that this kind of edict would go out. Well, listen, he says by to fulfill the prophecy of Jeremiah. Well, Jeremiah never mentioned Cyrus by name, but several times he mentioned that God is faithful and after 70 years, which happened almost to the date, after 70 years you will return and God is faithful. And that's what he was referring to when he said that the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled for the return. And here's what it says in Jeremiah 29.10. And then verse 11, you're very familiar with, very popular verse. As soon as Babylon's 70 years are up and not a day before, I'll show up and take care of you as I promised and bring you back home. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out, plans to take care of you, not abandon you, plans to give you a future and a hope. What a promise from God that in the midst of the judgment, he promises to take care of them. And after, and even says 70 years are up, not, not a day before. And it was a full 70 years. I'll show up and take care of you as I promised. So this is God's fulfillment of that prophecy in Jeremiah. However, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, did mention King Cyrus by name. He's in the book. <laughs> And God said this several years before Cyrus was ever born. It says, Thus saith of Cyrus, this is Isaiah chapter 44, Thus saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thou foundation shall be laid. So this is specific about King Cyrus would be the one God would use to rebuild the foundations of the temple and rebuild the temple and to return. This is an incredible, accurate prophecy. And it's very possible that Daniel reminded Cyrus about this prophecy. And so Cyrus knew that God had called him, and it was written in the book of the law that he would fulfill God's will. And maybe that's 
what was put on his heart, but God also placed it on his heart to let them return. So then it, it says this in the next verse, verse 5. Then the heads of the fathers, the houses of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all the whose spirits God had moved, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which were in Jerusalem. This is, is so amazing because it says that as many as God moved. You know, there's, there's a lot of people in the world, but not all are willing to do God's work. And he says that God put it on their heart, and so they returned. They were called by God for a purpose, and the Spirit moved them, and they were led by the Holy Spirit. Great way to start. And all those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with precious things besides all that was willingly offered. You know, there's a lot of shadow of things to come and patterns in the Bible that point to things to come. But this is incredibly familiar with the exodus from, from Egypt and how the people were delivered by the blood of the Lamb and God set them free and let them cross the Red Sea and go back to the Promised Land. And he had prepared a land for them. But before they left, it says they plundered the Egyptians. The Egyptians not only wanted them to go after all the plagues, they actually gave them articles to help build their temple and pay for some of the things they, they would need for the temple. And this is an incredible blessing. And the same thing happens here. They're going to return. You know, it says you can return to your first love. And that's what's so beautiful about this, that, that part of the pattern of deliverance is providing for you and how God will bless his people. And, and he did. He gave them all these articles. And then verse 7 says, King Cyrus also brought out the articles of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from Jerusalem and put in the temple of the gods. And Cyrus, king of Persia, brought them out by the hand of Mithridah, the treasurer, and counted them out to Shezbazar, the prince of Judah. This is the number of them, 30 gold platters, 1,000 silver platters, 29 knives, 30, 30 gold basins, 410 silver basins of a similar kind and 1,000 other articles. All the articles of silver and gold were 5,400. All these Shezbazar took with the captives who were brought from Babylon to Jerusalem. This is incredible. He wanted to make sure that everything was counted. Everything that was theirs was recorded and given back to them. Uh, when when ba the king of Babylon took all the articles and all the, 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 these precious items, silver and gold utensils and things from the temple, he stored them in basically like a museum. It was the temple of their gods uh, as something they could, they could brag about, about their conquering and, and the things that they had. But yet one of the kings, King Belshazzar, decided it was a wise idea to have a party and use the, the utensils from the temple of God. And it didn't work out too well for him because that's when God wrote on the handwriting on the wall and Daniel said, your time has ended. You've been numbered and you've found lacking. And God has taken the kingdom away from you this very night and that, because he, he took for granted God. Look, you don't mess with God. <laughs> I mean, it's not wise to come against God. And, and these are the same articles that were eventually given back to the Jews to take back when they got their heart right, which they did. And, uh, and that was when the Persians took over that very night. Belshazzar died, was killed, and the Persians took over the empire, which led to King Cyrus and the edict. So they got to return with everything they had. Now... The other thing that is so neat here, um, as we go through this next part in chapter 2, it says, Now these are the people of the province that came back from captivity, of those who were carried away from Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his own city. Those who came back with the Zerubbabel, they mentioned Joshua, who was the priest, 
and several other people, but Zerubbabel is the leader. And then I want to go down to to verse 36 because it mentions a, a whole lot of people. And, 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 you know, one of the things about the articles that were numbered, specific numbers, and then the, the number of exiles that came back, a specific number, you think, God is so accurate in history. You know, it, it points to the authenticity of Scripture, <laughs> the fact that everything is numbered and everything has a purpose and the kings and everybody is named by name. I mean, this is an incredible thing that God has given us such an accurate history. And then in verse 36, it says, the priest came back with, with uh, the sons of Jedidiah, which was of the house of Joshua and all the priests. In verse 40, it mentions the Levites going back. And they're both going to serve in the rebuilding of the temple. In verse 42, it says, The sons of the gatekeepers, the sons of the shalom, and all of them. that The gatekeepers are important. I mean, they watched the house of God. They were like the security team, and they watched the gates of the city. And, and so it just mentions in specific of how important of a role they play. Then it mentions the Nephilim, Nim, which I had to look up, obviously, but it means the dedicated ones, the ones that are set apart, the ones that are, are, are given to the work of, of the ministry. And these are people, and it's amazing God mentioned them. These are the people you can count on to do the work of God. You know, in every church, there's only a, a small percentage of people that you can count on to do the work of the ministry that are willing to go in. And God points them out specifically and says, these ones I remember. These are the ones that we can count on to do the work of God. And it's an incredible thing that they're mentioned in the book. And then as you go on further, it says in verse um, 64, let's see, there was something else I wanted to bring up. Oh, the singers. I miss the singers. <laughs> in verse 41, the singers the sons of Asaph, 128. 128, that's a nice size choir. But it amazes me that God puts so much emphasis on worship and people who will do the work of God, not just, not just believers in name only, but believers who are disciples that will follow Christ. But these singers led in worship. And, you know, what's an amazing thing is that God always points out to how, how you know, he inhabits the praises of his people. And the singers are important to God because they lead us into worship. And a lot of times, even when the army went forth, they were told to put the, the people playing the trumpets and the people who played all the instruments in front of the army, in the front line. And, and you know, that just shows that God's saying, look, I'm leading them. They're being led by me. And that, that's an amazing thing. But we got to put God first. Then in verse 64, it says, The whole assembly together were 42,360, besides their male and female servants, to whom there were 7,337. And then there were 200 men and women singers. Then it mentions their horses and their camels and donkeys and great number of animals that came back. And that's how they got the 49,000 from these numbers. And then verse 68 says, Some of the heads of the father's household, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, freely offered to the house of God to erect in its place. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury of the, the work six, 61,000 gold drachmas, 5,000 minas of silver, and 100 priestly garments. So the priest and the Levites, some of the people of the singers, the gatekeepers and the Nephilim, or the dedicated ones, dwelt in their cities and all Israel in their cities. You know, I wanted to mention somebody else here that was mentioned. And I'm, oh yeah, it's verse 55. It says, the sons of Solomon's servants. God even honored the servants who served in the house of Israel. And they weren't Jewish, but yet they go back with them. <laughs> Because you're part of the family of God now. And that's just, I just think that's beautiful. How God includes all people who are part of the kingdom. And uh, so they go back. But this part about they, they gave all the people that went back. Now they're giving their offerings to help rebuild the temple. 
They're given money. They're giving gold, silver, things to rebuild the temple. They're offering their labor. They're doing all of these things. And, and you know, no work of God goes without people giving. It's God's form of, of providing for God's work. But let me tell you, there's something about it when you give to God's work. It just brings you joy. It brings a blessing. God says he'll open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. And there's not room enough to receive it. I mean, God blesses the givers, but it puts their hearts right. And it's like they want to be a part of what God's doing. And, and no church can survive without the giving heart of people and how they can give. And God directs them to give, but, but we need people who give and people who willingly give to the work of the ministry. But it also shows they have buy-in and they want to be a part of what God is doing, just like giving to missions and missionaries and the work of God overseas. That's how you participate in the Great Commission. In addition to praying for them, you give to them and you help the work of the ministry. Um, amazing thing. Chapter 3. And when the seventh month had come and the children of Israel were in the cities and the people gathered together as one man in Jerusalem, then Joshua, son of Josadak, and his brethren and the priest and Zerubbabel, the son of Jatiel, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of God of Israel to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses and the man of God. Though fear had come upon them because of the people of those countries, they set the altar on its bases and they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening burnt offerings. It's, this is so perfect. It's like before you even start the work of God, before you start building the temple. And by the way, that's another important part. You know, you would think that God, that, that in human logic, you would say, we've got to build the walls and protect the city first. Then we'll build the temple. And then we'll build the altar and, and worship. No. The first thing they wanted to do, you're going to build the temple before you build the walls. Because you have to have God on your side. And you want to honor God and realize that God is part of the work. And that's why they did the altar. To give glory to God and to give thanksgiving to God. That he's going to provide and, and we're depending on you. Though fear fell upon them. On the people of the land. They were fearful of them. That they would come against them. But yet they still trusted God enough. To build an altar and offer burnt offerings and sacrifices to God to, to say, thank you for bringing us back. Thank you for delivering us. Thank you for providing us a new house for your work. And the altar is first, giving your heart to God first. That's so beautiful. And then it goes on and it mentions, they kept the Feast of Tabernacles, as is it written, and offered the daily burnt offerings and the number required by the ordinances of that day. The, the Feast of Tabernacles, it was also known as the Feast of Booths. They celebrated it for a week, uh, and it generally was right after the Day of Atonement. But what it recognized was the time they lived in temporary housing before they came into the Promised Land, how God provided for them in the wilderness. They lived in these, these, these booths and temporary housing. But it was a gratefulness and a thankfulness for God providing for them until they got their permanent home. Just like our home here, it's temporary. God, but God's making us a permanent home in heaven. <laughs> what a perfect picture of God's work. So it says they restored the, 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 the feast, and it says afterwards they burnt regular burnt offerings and those of the new moons and all the appointed feast of the lords that were consecrated. Those who everyone willingly offered a free will offering to the Lord. From the first day to the seventh day, they began offering burnt offerings to the Lord. Although the foundation of the temple of the Lord had not been yet laid yet, they did the altar first. You know, they did that when they went into the promised land. They built an altar first. They put an altar in, in the Jordan River when they crossed and one on the other side, one that wasn't seen and one that was seen. And it's just like in your heart, you have one that is inside. And you have one that's outside and to honor God. And people can go and see it and say, this points to God. This is where they crossed. 
They also gave money to the masons and carpenters and the food and drink and all to the people of Sidon and Tyre to bring cedar logs and from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa according to the permission which they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. Cyrus had given them permission to go to these other countries like Lebanon for the cedars of Lebanon and things they would need to rebuild the temple. But it says they gave their money. Part of their collection goes to the to the work. And they, they paid the masons and carpenters and the people of Tyre and Sidon for their wood. So all of God's storehouse is used for the work of the ministry. And we all pitch in. I mean, it's not just paying for the lights and for the electricity and the and the things we need to, to run the church and the ministers and, and those that work full time. It's not just that, but it's also to pay for the work that needs to be done when you have to replace things and you have to redo things after a hurricane. And you, you've got to pay people to do the work. And, and it's wonderful that they were part of that as well. The restoration of the temple can now begin. They began building the house of God. Now on the second month of the second year of the coming of the house of God at, at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, Joshua, the son of Josedach, and the rest of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all those who had come out of the captivity to Jerusalem began the work and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. The Levites were the ones that made sure it was built according to to the pattern that was set apart in the Old Testament, how it should be built and built correctly. Then Joshua and his sons and brothers, Kabdil and his sons and the sons of Judah, arose as one to oversee those working on the house of the God. And the sons of Hinnadad and their sons and their brethren, the Levites, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, it says, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Asaph and the cymbals to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to God for he is good and his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all the people shouted with a great shout when they had praised the Lord because of the foundation of the house of God was laid. So all of the priests and, the, and the, the Levites dress in their garb as they're preparing for worship and they blow the trumpets and, and the singers come out and they're all singing and shouting to God as they lay the foundation of the temple of God. This is just a beautiful picture of worship and doing it the right way and making sure they start right. But I love their praise and their singing for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Praise the Lord, giving honor and glory to God. And all the people shouted with a great voice. But then it says this. It says, But many of the priests and Levites, the heads of the fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first temple, they wept with a loud voice when the foundation of the temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. You have a mixture of people weeping, people that had seen the first temple, and people that were there before the captivity, that they wept over, over the loss of the temple and what they had before, and Solomon's beautiful temple. And they wept that they're seeing it rebuilt, and it just touched them. But at the, other, at the other part of the people were singing for joy because of the great joy of having the temple built. But they didn't have the history some of the older people did. And so this is such a beautiful picture of worship and how God worked among the people. This is a great beginning. <laughs> and uh, next week we'll study chapters 4 through 6 as we discuss how God prepared them and, and, and how they became had some resistance. Any work of God, you're going to get some resistance from the enemy. He's not going to be happy. And then you have the prophets show up to help encourage us to keep it up. Don't give up. Stand in there. Stand in the fight. And don't give up. It's worth it in the end. God bless you. Have a blessed week. 
Thank you, Lord, for your word and the pattern of a revival and the pattern and the beauty. And the, the Lord, help us always remember as we read scripture about how to put you first and to always bring glory to your name and thankfulness and to realize that we're all part of the kingdom of God and we're all to give and we're all to pray and we're all to be part of the ministry. Thank you, Lord. We honor you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.